my cheap wife friends were starting to cut in. <laughs> <laughs> We're recording, Jeffrey. We are. Cool. Hey. I'm glad about that. Because I'm very glad about that. Because this is going to be a good one. Because you're excited, so we won't, we won't, we won't do the whole. Hey, let's not say his name straight away and do the intro because we <laughs> realised that that name is written on the description yeah, for yeah. this and all, uh, all, the, all the promo that we'll have been doing. <coughs> excuse me, leading up to this point. <laughs> so, welcome back to the Crow Fro Show, episode number five. Okay. Possibly six. I don't know. We get they're coming in thick and fast now. I mean, we just we are prolific with these this this whole show really honestly we've never worked so hard that, actually, that's true actually yeah that's true and we are definitely uh learning a lot as we go along i wouldn't say we're quite polished just yet but hey polished definitely the guest the guest make it polished i don't think is ever going to be one of the many adjectives that would describe us it will not be in well if you list. if you put another word after it we, that's more nearer the truth yeah <laughs> uh, <laughs> my name is matt crowhurst I am and this Jeff guy Perrett. is Jeff That's Perrett. Me. That's the, the crow and the Jeff row. Maybe and that, the Jeff and the fro. That's Johnny oh, Cash. I need yeah, yeah. I've, 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 I was being listening to Johnny Cash this morning. Oh, has it, so got that, decided... has it got that dark over there, has it? Yeah. So I've decided Things to... Are very, um... very down <laughs> in the Perrett household. <laughs> started, started to slide. No, it's, it's not it's all bad. Not... It can't no, it's not. Be all bad because you bagged a scoop for us, Jeff Perrett. I can't claim anything to do with getting this next guy in this chat although he did meet me a few years ago so that probably probably tipped him over the edge if it was just That's exactly you, what it might is, have been tough know. yeah nothing to do with me nothing you to know. do even with though you. even though we're tight i mean you know yeah me and this guy i mean you know i mean I, obviously what's your relative age i i am i'm seven years his uh his senior and basically taught him everything he knows. Luckily for him, he missed you at your peak in terms of writing Absolutely. Career. But, the, you know, the comparisons are just almost spookily, you know. Um, you know, born around the same time of year, both ginger, both short, <laughs> both amazing. I really appreciate both, that. Both amazing on a motorcycle. So, you know. Let's not leave the man waiting any longer. No, and I think don't. it's only right, Jeffrey, that you do the honours. Okay. I'm very excited to say on this episode of the Crow Crow Show, we are about to talk to the one and only G O A T, GOAT. of all time motocross rider 16 time ama national champion it's mad uh ladies and gentlemen mr ricky carmichael should be on the other end of the line let's hope he is his name hey there he is, there it is. that was the best intro we've done so far jeff that was seamless. uh how are you doing ricky how is everyone everybody very good? good very good hey ricky hey, good to see you again it was Three years ago, two years ago, a good professor of speed, three years ago that you came over and threw some whips in amongst our action sports show for us. It was, it was, I think it was. It was good times having you there. So it was great meeting you then and a privilege to have you on our show. Thank you for taking time out. I imagine, oh. are you doing a whole ton of these chats left and right, apart from your own show, of course? Yeah, <laughs> look at you laughing. Uh, oh, yeah, no. actually, uh, last week was a little, a little slow. Uh, but this week we're in full swing, so I'm starting with you guys today. Uh, when we're done with you guys, when, when we're done with you guys, uh, I'm gonna go for a quick bike ride over lunch, and then get back, and we're gonna do film a real talk episode of that. And after I'm done with that at two o'clock, then I got a 4:30, another 4:30 Zoom meeting. So 
it never stops. This is a new normal, but it's a good problem to have, I guess. Man, JH is working you harder than when you used to race. I well, <laughs> race it. Well, Jeff, Basically. let's be honest. I work him. Remember, I'm the boss. Okay. You're the I'm boss. The, You're the I'm boss. I'm the boss of that show. <laughs> <laughs> just to uh, fill everybody else <laughs> in, as I've just recently been filled in, to explain who exactly JH is in your life, Ricky? Yeah, so JH is uh, he's the president of, of RC Racing, which is Ricky Carmichael Racing. And uh, we've been friends for a very, very long time. Uh, I met JH when uh, he was a Fox rep actually up in the northeast that's how i met him we were at a fox function and he would go to some of the races amateur and pro races what have you and then um, he left fox and he took a uh, regional sales um, position for american honda and that position was uh, north florida and south georgia so he relocated from the northeast down to florida and uh, in tallahassee of all places and that's where i live uh so we saw each other and uh, he was telling me that he was moving down and that was 1998 i believe at the end of 1998 and so i kind of took him in and um and and spent some time with him and yeah we became even better friends then and then he started doing some fa my fan helping my mom with fan mail and book work and stuff like that kind of on the side and then uh yeah next thing you know he we, we uh, kind of brought him on board, and yeah, now we, we have a couple companies together. And uh, just got, I just got to touch on this. I like the way that Ricky said that, um, and, and we took him in. Like we took was, him in off the like, streets, like, <laughs> like he was uh, like he was homeless or a stray dog. I, I love that, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's true, though. I like the way you took him in. But uh, having spent some time with you two, I mean, you know, it, it's a it's a relationship that clearly works. You know, you. you it's not just the fact that he he works for you and you do what you do together, but you guys really do get along and you you have more fun or you come across like you have more fun than what I thought when I first met you guys. I don't know why, maybe because of the the heights that you've reached in the sport that you have, but you guys have like real fun, a lot of bands, oh. a lot of piss taking, real good laughs. Oh, I mean, you, you have to, when you travel as much as we do and as you guys do, I mean, you know, you, you just have to, and you, you kind of lose your mind a little bit when you're on the road so much. But yeah, unfortunately for JH, I call him Curly, you know, but uh, that's, hey, yeah. nothing unfortunately wrong with that. Dude, for JH, wrong with that. <laughs> there you go. Unfortunately for JH, uh, the fun is at his expense. So uh, there's always, yeah, there's always got to be, the, there has to be that nominated person. There just has to be in every relationship. Well, and he's, and he's the guy, and he says a lot of silly stuff. That I'm um, like, see, you know, we think you think we just pick on you, but you open yourself up for that all the time by your little comments and JH isms. <laughs> <laughs> he secretly loves it because he knows that's a sign of affection. I'm and sure. any any attention. JH was at Goodwood with you as well, wasn't he? He was that's there. right. He yeah, was. So I would he have was. Met him there too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I got to tell you, man, I had so much fun at Goodwood. For those of you got for those uh, uh, you guys as viewers and listeners. Uh, that don't know. I was at Goodwood promoting uh, Visit Florida, uh, uh, Florida tourism. Uh, we had a lot of people from the UK that come to Florida, yep. Disney World and things of that nature. So uh, I was there uh, pumping up uh, Visit Florida as an ambassador. Of the, I was an ambassador of the state. And um, yeah, it was, it was a, what a, such a fantastic time. I had never been up that direction. Or I think I had, but I'd never been to uh, Goodwood. And just, I, I got to say, of all my motorsports uh, endeavors and the things that I've been exposed to and been able to go to and visit, that was one that's going to stick with me forever. It's, it's a pretty, pretty cool, crazy right? event, isn't it? For those, for those out there that don't know, perhaps over your part of the Atlantic and the rest of the world that hopefully will be watching this, it's a, the Goodwood Festival of Speed. And if you can get to it, you should get to it. If you're into yeah, bikes, yeah. cars, it's, it's, or even yeah. if you're not. Well, that's the thing. It's the, set, it's the setting as well. You know, you just take all these uh, motorsports, you know, obviously you know fossil fuel in, fuel burning vehicles and tear it up on a nice stately english home brilliant so ricky you know we're not gonna we we just want to talk to you obviously we all know um what you've achieved it's, I, I won't read the list because basically i run I out got, of, I, I, run out of, I run out of paper printing it <laughs> did, did curly send you guys that stuff or no no we just we just did our hey we did our homework because you know because we're good like that he didn't have okay. to do any ham, ha, homework he was just salivating over writing the list it came straight from memory ricky yeah, well, I mean, look at it. It's mad. But um, 
So just to, you know, just to have a quick run through your career. I mean, one thing I, I've never asked you, and I've, I've always wanted to, and I don't know why I've never asked you, um, you know, basically when you were coming through the amateur ranks over there, before you turned pro, as a kid, did you ever follow or take note of what was happening in, in the Euro, you know, GP scene, or is America at that point just so vast and and the focus is on just you guys over there as a kid I'm, as we, as you got older and raced in motocross of nations and whatnot you've probably paid more attention to it but as a kid growing up at your when you was that age did you pay much attention to like what was happening over here no i didn't unfortunately i didn't and it's grown exponentially for you guys uh in the uk and and all of europe it's so much more popular now and probably a lot of it has to do with media there's so many things so much more accessible i mean we didn't have any way of knowing about what was going on on that side of the atlantic unless it was in cycle news which was you get once every week uh so no i didn't pay attention to the stuff on the atlantic now on the other side uh we always had some people that would come to like the winter olympics uh in Gainesville and it would be uh was the Swanapools I believe it was yeah. uh so and they, you know they're from South Africa so I would kind of I kind of knew a little bit about racing other than in the US but it was on the opposite side of you guys so uh I didn't however and I'll tell you guys this real quick since we're on this I do wish one of the regrets, and I, I don't have hardly any throughout my career, um, and I wouldn't necessarily say it was a regret, but um, I always wanted to go over and win a GP, um, you know, through my career. Never was able to do that, just didn't have the time, didn't fit the schedule. But looking back, I think it would have been a cool accomplishment, definitely, because uh, I, I appreciate I appreciate Europe, all, everywhere where you guys go and the GPs, uh, so much uh, that I kind of I missed that opportunity and I think that would have been a nice little uh, feather in my cap if you will um, it just it's just so cool do you I think have, that, I would have you, definitely needed another sheet yeah of paper we, there's, 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 there's more paper in the world to fill out do you think there is more of an awareness am, am, amongst the US scene now of, of the GP and the varying terrains and the variety of racing that can be done in Europe is, is there more of an incentive there to get to Europe from the U S um, I'm not so sure that there's an incentive, but it's definitely more aware. Uh, you know, there's, there's more people watching it. I feel maybe it's just because I'm a little bit older and I realize there's more people watching it. That could be, but you know, with social media and, and the media outlets that we have these days, it's so much easier and convenient to watch you guys and the same for you guys to log yeah. in and watch us. So uh, yes, there's definitely, I feel like there's a more buzz and of course uh, with the motocross of nations, how, how popular of an event that is and how well uh, the European riders and the guys that race MXGP is all the other countries are doing compared to, to the U S guys in that particular event. It's brought a lot of buzz to the fans in, in the U S so uh it's cool now and this isn't a slight towards the guys that i raced against uh that were racing gps at the time but i really believe that you guys the gp series has a really uh, deep crop of great talent uh goes pretty deep uh compared to like i said when the, the guys that i was racing against and please like i said don't i don't want anyone to take that as a slight but I think that most people would agree with me. Y'all got a lot of talent right now. And uh, it, it's, it's cool to see. Uh, I, it really is. And, and that's good for you guys. I would definitely agree with that. Um, you we'll know, that. years of when, uh, like I said, you guys were dominating the motocross of nations or whatever. I often thought if they just had, if they, if they made it more like the Ryder Cup, where it was like 15 Americans against 15 GP riders, that's probably where Europe, coming up through the 80s would have come out on top a bit more because there was a kind of more depth, like you're just saying. So that's interesting. And also, I remember when we were growing up in the 80s and whatnot, like you said about the, the contrast between each country, uh, Europe and America. For us, growing up in the 80s, seeing all, like, we've now, I think Europe's now caught up with in the fashion stakes. And I, I do mean it, like, we used to, you guys over there always used to have, like, the cool, mainly because of Supercross, but you'd have all the new cool kit first, all that kind of stuff. 
and let's be honest, Euro style in the 80s was, well, mm. let's be honest, it wasn't. <laughs> it, well, and this is, and I want to tell, like, and that was the crazy thing is when I went to uh, Fox Hills in 98 for uh, the Nations, uh, Des Nations at the time, yeah. and I'm like, dude, look at these dudes, like, their jerseys are, like, there's nothing on their jerseys, they're wearing their chest pros inside of their jerseys, and it was, to me, it was just so crazy, and their style for... I was like, ah, oh, style is on the actual bike. Isn't that great? They look so stiff. Now you watch these guys' style. It's fun to watch. And uh, definitely, sir, it, it, it has definitely changed without, about, uh, without a doubt to, to, for the better. Yeah, I, but that's, that's, where I, that's, where, that's where I think a lot of Euro riders watching Supercross, and because we weren't yeah. doing that over here, and then have just basically throughout the 80s, early 90s, started practicing and perfecting their technique from watching Supercross and maybe more Supercross races started over here. And that's probably where it kind of, where the Euro riders started to get a little bit more on par um, with, with you guys and what you were doing. Do you sure. think, apart from aesthetics, which is of course all important, but do you think Supercross leaves so less room for error over motocross that the technique, which then re results in the style, has to be so much tighter, which is why the the motocross in europe of, of that time was maybe a little bit more all over the place compared with supercross in the states yeah i think so I, I i think there's i think there's some truth to that um and that goes to and i'm sure you guys want to talk about it i'm jumping all over the place here but no, cool, I, can't, go with it. I can't answer that question properly without explaining you know my thoughts of why I think where where the U.S. is based on uh, based on our results for the motocross of nations. Listen, guys, there's, there's no secret that Supercross. Is, this is what these guys want, and when they take the track or to practice on Supercross, most of these guys are thinking, okay, how the hell do I go faster? What do I got to do to be faster in this in this corner? What do I got to do to be faster in this rhythm section over here? and everything is geared towards that we work they work so long and hard for that championship and then when it comes outdoor time they do just enough to get by not saying everybody does that but it's just like okay we got to go testing and okay we got to do our motos this this week and it's almost like they're just doing enough to get by so as that has been kind of the mindset the last 10 years, let's just say, uh, of course, of, and, 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 and the guys at the GPs, you know, this is, they eat, sleep, breathe GP. They go to the GP track on, during practice and like, okay, how the hell can I go faster? What do I got to do to freaking get in that corner faster? Not saying our guys don't do that, but there's not as much emphasis while they take the motocross track it's just like okay i only got to do 30 minutes to get the job done this week yeah. i'm just going to do 30 minutes where supercross are going to be like i only have to do 30 minutes but i'm probably going to do 45 45 to 50 minutes because i want to be that that much better and unfortunately you know times change guys you know the world the changes priority, and that, that, that that's that's my thoughts on it yeah. Uh, not taking anything away from the MX guys, I I think that there's a so I, there's so much talent, a great crop of talent coming out of there. Guys are super super fast, a lot of effort going into the racing over there, and um, yeah, yeah. So, but like you said, it's it's a, it's a different animal though, Ricky, isn't it? Because Supercross over there for you guys is it's it's higher stakes. I'm guessing you know more money in the contracts, the prize purse, and, and stuff like that. So Supercross obviously is more of a bigger thing and, and the priority. And, and that's sometimes shown when it's come to selecting a team for USA, for the Motocross of Nations, and et cetera, and, and stuff like that. Do you think that uh, American Motocross would be in a worse or better place if you guys um, wasn't, for example, doing Supercross, if Supercross didn't come along in the 70s? Do you reckon Motocross would, would you know, be in a better place or a worse place? Because it's... Yeah. Supercross is obviously the, the thing to really go for now for you guys over there. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think I think so. Um, unfortunately, and dude, you guys know. I mean, I had a, a, most of my success uh, was in motocross. Uh, you guys know how much I loved go to the motocross of nations. I mean, 
I remember I was so bummed in 1997 that I didn't get picked for the motocross of nations. I mean, I remember turning pro my first year and one thing I want to do is be uh, picked to go to motocross of nations. It was like an honor. Um, and when I didn't, I was bummed. Now looking back, they made the right decision. There's no way I needed to go to motocross of nations. My first year being a rookie, only 17 years old, that wasn't the right decision to bring someone like me. I needed another year under my belt. So I agree with this situation and bringing Steve Lampson instead of me. Um, however, I just, you know, things, things change and it's just, I, I, going back to your original question, definitely, um, you know, the Supercross, having Supercross, how popular it is, and the TV numbers that it gets, coverage that it gets um you know the venues we go to it's more convenient the races are shorter uh the attention span of people i would say in general these days are a lot shorter yeah. so <laughs> you know what i mean it really is absolutely it's, it's like yeah. the attention span of a gnat for for some of yeah. these people so i mean you know i kind of dive in a little bit deeper and look at look at things and why are things the way that they are and that's my opinion. Um, it's, it's a bummer, you know, like I said, because motocross, I love motocross and it was always easier for me. I felt like the harder you work, the better you did where supercross is a little bit more talented, uh, related, meaning guys that don't work quite as hard off the bike and have more raw talent can do a little bit better. Uh, when you really, it's not like that in motocross. You got to work your ass off. <clears throat> and, and that's because of the short, sharp, intense nature of supercross versus motocross. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Is there <clears throat> a couple of questions? When you when you first started getting into supercross after going through the ranks of motocross, did you find it hard jumping back and forth, or did that just become second nature? Was was that an issue for you? I mean, obviously the results would say it wasn't, but did you have to wrestle with that at all? Well, that's a great question. So. Going from moto to supercross was way harder of a transition. Obviously going from supercross to motocross was much, much easier for me without a doubt. So I didn't struggle with it much. And I think that's what some of these guys are faced with right now. You know, how, how are they juggling getting ready for MX season coming up? You know, it's on the, it, we know that that's coming for sure. And when the hell are they going to go supercross racing? So how do you divide that time up? So, you know, are you going two days, you know, on MX and two days on SX? Or are you going a week on MX and a week on SX? You know, I'm not, I'm not sure, you know, and I don't know that everybody, all the guys are going to tell you exactly what they're doing because they want to keep it somewhat of a secret. Uh, they want to give, they want to give their secrets away to their competitors. Um, so, yeah, for me, it was hard going from um, MX to SX. With, um, <clears throat> what we found in the UK, what I found from getting into the sport over the past few years on the commentary front, not quite on the riding front yet, although mm -hmm. hopefully Jeff's going to change that apparently, um, is um, with Arena Cross that we have over here, which is that indoor series in the UK, yeah. which yeah. is our only, only um, yeah. Supercross style event. There isn't anything that leads to that for a lot of our riders. So quite rightly, th they're saying, well, we're worried about doing this because it's so intense, because it's so gnarly and we don't get to practice. Um, is there, are there those stages through, through which a rider can go to get themselves to the higher supercross stakes? Or is it literally that raw talent that's being picked out of the motocross crowd that, that leads them there? Or, or is there a pathway? Well, there is a pathway and that's what we did. Uh, that's what we were using the uh, Amsoil Arena Cross series that we had going the yeah. Carmichael Road to supercross. And I was a huge advocate for putting that together because I, I, I thought that these guys, they can't just be dumped right into Monster Energy Supercross. It'd be like you, us going out and buying a MotoGP bike and going out and racing with MotoGP against that. You know, and, and you shouldn't be able to do that, mainly, mainly for your personal safety and yeah. the other safety as well. So there, yes, there are... Um, we have put, so now with the um, Supercross Futures, now the tracks are a little bit, you know, they're watered down, but for good reason, for safety reasons, first and foremost. I mean, you can't just set these amateurs out on a full-blown Supercross track. So yes, there are, uh, we have the uh, Road to Supercross, Supercross Futures program that uh, you have to go through to, to accumulate enough points to then 
get your um, get your pass to Monster Energy Supercross. And I think it's worked well. Uh, even though the tracks are tamer, you're still kind of in that environment. Yeah. Tracks are a lot smaller. You're in stadiums. And I think it's been fantastic what Feld has been able to do. I mean, and the uh, commitment that they have made uh, to, to put that on for the amateurs is, is fantastic. I mean, those things, those places aren't cheap to rent out, I'm sure. <laughs> and uh, to, to provide a place not only for the, our Supercross Futures and for those guys to go and get experience riding in that kind, on that kind of track, in that kind of atmosphere, it's also a great place for the youngsters to go race or guys like you and I that just want to go out and enjoy, you know, enjoy the races, ride at our own pace, and and have a little bit of fun. It's been fantastic. So yes, there are uh, avenues that uh, these riders have to take before they race Monster Energy Supercross, and I think that's important. Hey, Ricky, your your pro career is obviously well documented because of the, the success that you've had. But one thing I wanted I wanted to ask you is like, growing up as a kid, okay? So you know, did, did you? obviously America's a vast place to do the amateur scene. So how was growing up as a kid, like just, just schooling, fitting that in, the sacrifices your parents had to make? How hard is it for a kid in America to, to really sort of be competitive at the sharp end of the amateur scene? Because, I mean, you guys have to put so, so many miles in because obviously over here in Europe, we do national championships. So, that, so it's all separated into countries. But you guys, you have to, jump in a wagon, you know, or motorhome and travel right to the other side of America to do a race. How does that work with the, with the family? There must be so much sacrifice put in. So much sacrifice. And that's one thing that I feel that I've, I've learned from, I learned at a very young age. I really learned the sacrifices that my parents made, Jeff. I, I, I really did. And I don't know how I learned it, but I learned it at a very young age. I would say somewhere between 11 and 12, where I was like, man, I see what my parents are doing. They're all in. We have nothing. And, you know, my mom was scoring local races, so they would waive my sign-up fee, or she was working the concession stand. I don't know what it is, you guys. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, she was working concession stands to waive, you know, waive, waive my sign-up fees. Um, so that made me work harder. And, and essentially, I was racing for them not even myself at that point. I just wanted to pay them back and, you know, make them happy uh, because I, I could see the burden that they were, that was put on them just to get me to where I am today. And yeah, it could have yeah. easily not worked out. For most, it doesn't. So to answer your question, yeah, there's a financial sacrifice. Um, there, um, fast forwarding, I feel like it's harder today, like as far as traveling yeah. goes to the races. I'm going to tell you why, because I don't feel like there's as many local races. See, when I was racing amateurs, we would practice during the week. I went to school, regular school. I didn't do homeschooling, so I never did. Oh, okay, because that was... Yeah, yeah, I never did homeschooling. And the, the facilities and stuff like you see these days, mm. there, there weren't any facilities back then. So we would go to like local local tracks and, and local like backyard tracks and ride uh, during the week, like four, four days a week. And then we would race on the weekend. There were a lot more local races on the weekend. So that what we did, we didn't have to travel. The travel wasn't so far. Now, nowadays the, you know, these kids, they're all they're doing really is they're practicing during the week and then they're racing the bigger events. And it's been like that for several years now. Of course, there's a couple of regional races in between, but a lot of them aren't doing that anymore, and uh, they're they're just practicing during the week. I personally, if my kids raced, I would probably do a little bit less practice during the week and race as many places as I could because no matter how much you practice during the week, nothing replicates racing. Nothing. I don't care who you are, what you do, what you think, and I will debate you all day on that. <laughs> And, no, and I'm not going to argue so, with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Jeff, the, 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 yeah, to, to, to go back to, to what you're saying, for sure, um, the travel is a lot. They got to drive so far, and uh, there's less races, you know, like during, you know, each weekend like there was when I was growing up. So a lot different now. Do you think, that, do you think that talent slips through the net because of that? Because there are just people out there who can't do the miles. And if there were more local regional events at all your local um, motocross supercross no tracks. 
I, I don't think that the, uh, I don't think that the, the talent is slipping. I think the race craft is a little bit different because they, they, uh, they, only race a, they only race a few times a year. Well, I say a few times a year, but you guys know what I'm saying. Yeah. If I was racing 25 weekends a year, these guys are racing 10 weekends a year. So you don't get that race craft, you yeah. know? And the only reason, the only way to get that race craft is or by races. being in that situation yeah. all the time. So I believe that's where things have changed. Like the race craft has changed a little bit because these guys don't race as much. They practice all the time. And I will tell you this, the reason that I feel the riders are so close these days at the amateur level and there's not a whole lot of standout guys is because they all ride together. They know what everyone's doing. They're all on the same, most of them are on the same program. Because and they all go to the same races as opposed to racing in their own backyard a lot and then joining. And pr most important, practicing in their backyard. Oh, like right, I, okay. I, I, didn't, I didn't practice with a lot of people. No, but now all these, a lot of these riders ride at facilities or they ride with their friends all the time. So yeah. where's the separation? They're, yeah. You know, the, the, did that did that used to excite you as an amateur, knowing that you were going to go and race with somebody that you don't often race, but you've obviously heard, you know, they're doing well over the West Coast and they're a bit of a name, you know, and you're like, right, I'm going to go, we're, we're going guns at, you know, guns at dawn yeah. with this guy. I'm, because you don't get to race them. So did that put extra pressure on or did, you, did that fire you up to go, well, I don't race this guy very often, but I'm going to hand it to him this weekend? Uh, no, I was always scared to death. I was going to really? get beat up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So to answer that question, I was excited to go to a different track, not the same ones that I yeah. would always go to in our kind of region, like, Florida, Georgia, and that, that area. There were so many tracks back then when I was racing amateur. Uh, so if we would go to a, a, a couple states further away, yes, I was excited, but at the same time, there was a lot of pressure because I knew I was going to be racing against guys that I don't always race yeah. against, and I was going to tracks that I wasn't familiar with, and what you know, who was I going to be facing against? I really didn't know who I was going to be racing. So yes, I was excited that there was a new track, uh, but I was nervous about who I was going to be racing. Great times, though. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like, when I look back on it, when I look back on my career, I, I believe that these, these times were very, very special. And honestly, uh, I wish I could have enjoyed them a little bit more. I really do. Uh, that, that's that, easy with that, hindsight. But, though, but at the, you know, but at the same time, you know, I mean, I was always expected to win. So there was always that pressure there, you know? Yeah. And is that uh, pressure look, you put on yourself? Now, uh, well, it, you know, yeah. I know you just by having like a high profile ride, riding for Team Green and all that, that's going to bring a degree of pressure. But did you, do you feel now looking back that you maybe dumped more pressure on yourself than you needed to at that stage of your career? Yeah, for sure. Without a doubt, I overdid it without a doubt. Like I practiced way more than anybody did. Now, looking back, it set it me up because that gave me the base for when I turned professional. But yeah, yeah I definitely as I did as an amateur for sure as far as workload goes but you know you 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 ask did I put too much pressure on myself I did because remember I told you I I noticed the sacrifices that yeah. my parents were making and then it was like we go to the races to win we don't go to the races to participate we're going to win and you're going to go you're going to go there you're going to do your best you're going to try to make as small amount of mistakes as possible and we're here to we're here to race. We're going to do it right, or we're not doing it at all. I would and just like to take that that sound bite there and yep. record that, Matt. And if we can send that off to all uh, British schools to play in classrooms, that would be fantastic. It's because, not the uh, taking part that yeah, counts. You wet. We, we don't get taught that in the UK. Oh no, it's, it's the taking part that counts. But in in America, you guys are more like it's about being involved and being and winning particularly you guys anyway yeah i mean that and that and that was the thing jeff it's like do we like i said we're going there to win and it just, that's just the way it is yeah hey you mentioned you mentioned about how your your training was very different to um the, the, the way training is r right now um and from talking with ben townley last week yeah that was uh, good mentioning that uh, it, yeah, you, you, your training was relatively solitary compared to what it is now. Is, is, is that the, the, the case across the board? Does, does anybody sort of reenact the same model of training that you had now, do you think? 
I think that um, because of uh, Eldon and how many years we spent together, we spent what, seven years together? I mean, he knows what I was doing and I know what he was doing off the track. You know, yeah. we kind of, you know, like when you work with someone for seven years, we know the ins and outs of it. So I think he has taken somewhat of what I did on the track and has implemented that into his full program. So when you go to, the, to that facility, you're, you're getting a, some, some kind of version of what, what we did for seven years on, on the track. Um, it's not every, it's not to a T. I definitely did a lot more than most have done, but that's what it took for me. You know, yeah. I, I didn't have as much, obviously I was born with a talent, but I need it require, I, I required a lot more saddle time than, than most do. And, and I'm okay with that. It helped me be really comfortable with the motorcycle. Uh, but I don't, I don't think these days that the guys are riding quite as much. I will say maybe it, maybe it's qual maybe a little more quality riding, but uh, yeah, like as far as what I did, I wouldn't recommend it for everybody. It, it your, just you know. your relationship, obviously, with your mum and, and and the fact that she trained you is is well documented. So thinking back about that, do you, a lot of it came from within from within you, obviously. Do you do you think that you you still would have pounded out those motors and done as much if your mum hadn't have been you know on for a better word pushing you and on your case? Well, that's a great question. Um, I am a pretty self motivated person. Uh, it's always nice to have that kick in the ass, but um, it didn't take a lot for me to get motivated. Like I didn't need someone to tell me. Like I didn't hire Elvin Baker because I couldn't get out of bed and go do my stuff. Yeah. And yes, was it my mom just held me accountable? She didn't make <laughs> mom's dinner, you know, man. They do do that. Yeah. So there was so, there was there was never a point at, at which in all of that training, I mean, uh, there was a, there was never a significant point at which you thought this is just a bit too much. I'm not enjoying my racing as I want to enjoy it because I'm doing oh, too much. Oh, hell yeah, dude. Yeah. Probably 80% of my career. <laughs> 80, yeah, I'm like, do I really right. need to be doing this? Yeah, there's no oh, doubt. Oh, that's I mean, cool. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it wasn't, <laughs> listen, I loved racing, but when I was a little kid, I, dude, I hated going to the track. I've, I've said this in an interview with my good friend Sam Jones. It's like, I would be praying and hoping that the track it would rain or there a storm would come so i wouldn't have to practice <laughs> all the time it was all and, the racing was obviously different that you know like the, so when you got to the race that that you forgot all that and that's where you really wanted to be that's yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. for the most but, part but the training bit you just absolutely beasted yourself into doing it every day yeah, i just I, I had to do it now as i got older i would say in my last four years i appreciated going out and practicing and stuff like that i didn't I'm like, okay, let's go ride today. It's it's going to be fun. I'm going to go through my routine because I, I found little uh, nuances of the track where I need to be better and how I could challenge myself and learning the bike and what it does and blah, blah, blah. The, the, the workings and the ergonomics of the bike and, you know, and, and how things operate. Um, I found a lot of joy and pleasure in learning that side of things. So that kind of kept my mind occupied while I was out there practicing and doing my routine that made it a lot of fun. Uh, so that those feelings went away probably in my last four to five years, more realistically. Oh, right. I, really? Yeah, yeah, I enjoy I enjoyed it. But before then, especially in my amateur years, I can't tell you the amount of times I'm like, man, I just, I want to quit. This isn't fun. It just because I just did it all the time yeah. <laughs> but you're having a lot of fun now though i am I, well, it certainly comes across like you are you know because you get you know you, you're doing a load of things in the sport all different avenues and of course you can still get out and bust some laps and still show these kids how to throw a bike around yeah you know it's uh, i'm in a great position i'm very fortunate and uh, i've worked really hard myself and you Jay. the right yeah you know to uh really live off of what i built Ooh. Uh, while I was racing, you know, I'm, uh, I'm what, 14 years post-retirement just about for, from racing. And uh, my gig with NBCSN is, is a lot of fun. Love being in the booth. I love doing the RCUs. I love the uh, RCSX uh, that I do. Uh, my involvement with the Supercross Futures is a lot of fun. You know, giving back to the sport. I really enjoy that. 
brand ambassador stuff uh, for all my sponsors that have uh, been with me and supported me since my retirement. And then, you know, it's starting to get into the uh, adventure riding. I mean, that's a huge yeah. market. It's yes. a lot of fun. It kind of fits perfectly into where I'm at in my life and the eight, you know, I'm 40, uh, I'll be 41 this, this November. So it uh, really, it really falls into uh, a great place and, and things are working out. Is it something that I want to do forever? Probably not, but at least another, you know, five to 10 good more years. Yeah. Uh, you know, what, what else am I going to do? It's something that I enjoy. I get to sit, you know, see guys like you when I come to the UK. And I think the older you get, the more you appreciate stuff like that. I'm glad the RCU is going well. It'd be good to see you back in the UK with one of them sometime. You can teach this guy to ride. He needs some yeah, quality. I do need I mean, might not be. Some, from, some people say I might need the help. Jeff, from what you were telling me, there might not be any hope. Well, no, there's hope. There's always hope. There's I'll always give, hope. We I'll can't give him, give him one thing. I'll give him one thing. He's not scared. I will give him that. Well, that's the scary part because the guys that's, that aren't that's basically scared. the problem. I've got delusions of bike riding grandeur. That's actually the issue. <laughs> that's, that's, it's the guys like you that scare me to death because I'm like, oh, dude. You got to respect the, you got to respect the machine, right? Everybody, yeah. so well, everyone well, always says, man, you, you raced dirt bikes. You must be, you must have no fear. And I'm like, ah, you're wrong. I said, the guys that don't have no fear, don't have fear are the guys that end up getting hurt a lot because they're not worried about yeah, getting there, hurt. There, there, there might be some, I mean, I'll be honest. I have, I'm scared all the time on the bike. I'll be honest, but I still got these delusions of, 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 of being all right at riding. <laughs> See, the trouble is he, he, he uh, you know, he does the arena cross. We, we watch them like, for example, at good work. He's watching yeah. you float. He's watching you float above him, busting big whips. And in Matt's mind, he's going, that can't be that hard. Just, just huck it, don't you? You just hit it. <laughs> right. No doubt. No Let's doubt. Do it. Yeah, well, if we ever get back to the UK and we do an RCU, you can, uh, I'll, I'll sponsor you to be, it'll be on me, my friend. Nice. Oh. Just bring some training wheels. I don't want to cause an accident <laughs> at one of yours. Yeah. You right. will cause an accident. Set up a big uh, freestyle ramp jump for you. Well, I did actually just <laughs> recently with some of the boys who were at the show, the, the Bold Up Boys, Dan Whitby and crew, I went, and, I went and jumped into a pit just recently. Oh, really? When did, you, when did you do that? Uh, it, was, it was only on a little, um, a little 100 thing, like at the end of last year. I was quite oh, nervous okay. the whole time. Yeah, yeah, that was a trick question. I wanted to make sure you were social distancing. See, Jeff, uh, I was going to yeah, try it. I can see it. Like, right, right, right. about three weeks ago. Yeah. This was about ah. three weeks ago. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. watch sorry. this space. Jeff sorry. and I have got challenges on with the Crow Fro show after this that will involve all of these. Oh, yeah. The I've got to try. To. Very in yep. Unfortunately, he's got to try surfing and wakeboarding, which might be more entertaining than me riding a bike. Probably will. Oh. Like hey, uh, Jeff, Jeff mentioned that you had uh, some wakeboarding goings on. Have you been, you've been riding yourself? Um, I, used to wake, I used to wakeboard yeah. a lot yeah? and really enjoyed it, absolutely. I haven't in so many years now, but it's funny you say that because I've been looking into trying to get another uh, wakeboard boat. All right, well. I live on a private lake, so I, I got lake access. I got a dock and stuff, and uh, right out my right out my backyard. So you were sponsored by was it was Nautica? Nautica. Nautica. Yeah, Me Nautica. too. Yeah. Well, there you go. The only nice. boats to go for, man. Well, um, yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, right? Right. Hey, did stuff. you wake when you were wakeboarding? Did you wake surf, which is that board there? Did no, you no, no, no. I was wakeboarding. I see that six nine right there. I had one of those. This, and yeah, then uh, I had a few, brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. I had a few, uh, hyper lights and, uh, yeah. And then right when I got rid of, uh, my boat, the, the wake surfing was just starting to like scratch the surface. Okay. Well, the, well, the wake surfing, which you're going to be trying, uh, in not too long, we hope Jeff is mind boggling. We're talking hip high waves that you cruise on forever. So, well, you yeah. know, you know, the, you know, the cool thing about that, why I would enjoy it because you're not going so hard, you're not going fast, it's slower speed, so the impact, like, see, I'm getting older now, that's the kind of stuff I look at. I'm like, well, that would be fun, you can get that challenge, and you're not risking your life at it. You can you know? drink while you're doing it, someone just throw you a beer from the back of the boat, that's all important. Oh, you got the, yeah. you got the tunes going. <laughs> the tunes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I must confess, I must confess, I have tried uh, Wake, uh, what? Wake well, surfing. Wake surfing at Lake Elsinore when we went to a monster boot camp. 
All right. How'd it go? How'd it go? It was, all, it was all right. But obviously, I had all those young lot there as well, like Faulkner and all that. So they're going to be much better than me. And I felt I, it showed my age at that point. I was thinking, man. <laughs> Put the violin away I, well, again, I, know, I, I thought I was cool, but then you got cool kids, mo moto well, kids. Well, there was your first problem. <laughs> yeah, that's the trouble. <laughs> um, obviously, you know, we don't want to take up too much time, Ricky. We know you've got loads of these to do just today alone. Um, so moving forward, I, I really wanted to know rivals, right? We all know you've Ooh. had some great ones, but we won't dwell on it too much. But in your, in your pro career, you know, who coming through was one that now that you finished racing that you kind of maybe had a different mindset to or more respect to or, or whatever? I mean, or I, less respect I was there. I was there. I think if you remember, the first time I met you was uh, Unadilla in 03, I think, when I came out with Doc Wobb and we did a road trip. In fact, I've got a picture somewhere of you and me giving the bird to, to the cameraman. That actually we'll find that. We'll moment. find that and, and put that, that right up. There you and, go. And I can remember, I think Wyndham had a really good day that day. And this is the first time I'd met you. And you came in from one of those motos. And man, the, the, just the look on your face. I, did, I just thought, he is just going to smack somebody in a minute. You look so pissed that Wyndham had turned you, you over. Yeah, right. Day. I was pissed. I don't like yeah. to lose. <laughs> then I, I, I remember that day in Cliff White, who was one of the uh, engineers, engine guys at Honda for a very long time. He was, but David Bailey's mechanic and Jean Michel Bale's mechanic. Uh, anyhow, uh, I remember him coming back to the truck after the second moto, after Wyndham just put it to me. He was on the CRF at the time. That's right. You was on the two strike. Yeah, right? it was like I was going to a gunfight with a knife, and he told me, he's like, RC, he says, dude, <laughs> you couldn't have ridden that bike any faster. He says, you, you didn't get beat today because of your – your lack of effort and says that you weren't going to beat him on that bike today. So, um, so yeah, so yeah. real quick, uh, luckily for me, I've, I've raised some of the best guys in the world. I just came up through that time. Uh, the record book shows it. Jeremy McGrath, uh, a lot of respect for Jeremy and what he's been able to accomplish. Uh, the King of Supercross 72 wins. Don't think that's ever going to be touched. Uh, so to be able to beat him, that was fun. What was fun about racing Jeremy is you never had to look uh, over your shoulder. Uh, so a lot of respect for him. Uh, Kevin Wyndham, the same thing. Um, mm. A lot of rivalry there. Um, and the reason that was is because he was supposed to be the guy, and then I came in and ended up doing a little bit better than he did. So, uh, But he was another guy that you could race. You could race hard, and he was never going to so take it. So natural, right? It's just such yeah. a natural ability. Just for those of us, I, 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 can't, I think I get what you, what you mean by the not looking over the shoulder. Do you just mean like a tough but a fair racer by not having to look over your shoulder within a race? Yeah, yeah. You never had to be on defense that much because you knew there wasn't going to be a cheap shot being pulled. Um, Moving on, then, then, of course, Chad Reed and James yeah. Stewart. And all these guys that I raced, I had a strategy. For, my strategy was different for each of these guys. You, the, in order to beat them, you had to race a different way, and, like, the tactics were completely different. Uh, Chad, was, Chad was really, really hard to beat. Uh, when he was on, uh, he, he, he was good. And when he was off, he was still good. And he was really consistent. You always knew what you were going to get. James Stewart, on the other hand, at the time, he was, uh, when he was a, a rookie, he was really, really wild, uh, but fast. Uh, but you never knew which James Stewart was going to get. As he grew a little bit older and matured, uh, we had some really, really fun battles, especially in the outdoor season mm -hmm. of uh, 2006 and 2007. And... You know, as far as speed goes, Supercross was always, I, I could never match his speed for the most part. I had to win on a technicality, and that was built in. You know, try to pressure him as much as I could, get him to make a mistake, and then boom, take advantage of it. And the same for outdoors. I always knew that, felt that I was a little bit stronger than him. So uh, I'm just going to ride my pace and, and keep up with him and try to wear him out. And then halfway, through just you know try to make my moves and, and win in the latter part of the race but uh nevertheless it was always i feel like there was always a mutual respect between james and myself which uh which made it fun um so a, a lot of a lot of tough rivals those those four guys that i mentioned are the ones that come to my mind now, i've raced a lot of other great guys as you know uh but those are the guys that uh, i really um tailored my practice training 
and race strategy around to people. I was just going to say that. Did you know when you're there working out on the on the side, going for a bike ride, a push bike ride, or doing what you do in the gym? Did any of them ent- enter your head as extra <laughs> motivation? I mean, did you ever sort of you're there lifting weights or doing anything thinking? Oh man, shit, read. I'm like, oh, do you know, and try harder. How does it work? No, not for not for that. That no, not at the gym, like off the bike stuff. No, I yeah, just no. That was all just for me personally. That kind of stuff, what you're saying, was more done at the practice track. Okay, how can I be a little bit better in this corner to be better than Chad? Or how can I be a little bit faster over here to be better or challenge James a little bit better? The same for Kevin, the same for Jeremy. Can you give a snapshot? You mentioned that you had different strategies for each of them. Can you give a snapshot of one of those different strategies? Yeah, so so real quick, Jeremy McGrath, uh, to beat him, I knew that he wasn't willing to take the risk that I was and kind of like get a little loose and ride a little more out of control. He was very reserved, a lot like Chad. Chad and him are very similar. I knew to beat both of those guys, I just had to hang it out and not fall off. (laughs) <laughs> and I would have a good chance of beating beating them. Uh, Kevin, uh, I just I, I knew that I I could I knew that I was stronger physically than him and and had better endurance. So if I could just stay with him and pressure him and pressure him, I know that most of the times that that he would he would buckle, you know, later on in the race. And for James, he was so fast that I knew like. My goal was never to be faster than him. My goal is to be as fast as him and just kind of sit back there and pressure, 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 and hope that he would make a mistake and take advantage of the mistakes. I'm loving this. I, 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 it's just to get inside your head a little bit. And I was laughing throughout that because I, I actually visualized as you were talking a few of your what I would call miraculous saves in Supercross. I mean, <laughs> you had a few proper clangers. Dude, more, more than a but more than more than a few, my man. More than my a few. God. I mean, I've seen you ride along the top of about I don't know about ten tough blocks and, and still manage to keep it on track. Yeah, watch uh, Houston, Houston 2002 and the main I'm writing event. it down. We yeah, well, it oh in. my God, Houston, man. 2002 main event. I think it was just after I got past uh, my teammate Nathan Ramsey. That that was a good one, uh, yeah, dude. I oh, mean, you but bet. but that's how I beat the guys that were a little more reserved. Yeah. Uh, I was so also- yeah, strategies for all those guys, and there were times when I was racing James, mm. and he was the same way too. He didn't want me behind him, and yeah. I didn't want him behind me. So there were times where he would literally, I felt like he would try to slow down, so I would get in front of him, and then the, and then same for me. Like I would purposefully slow down to try to get him to pass me so then I could get right on his ass and follow him. See, now looking back at, now looking back at your career, you know, and listen to you talk like that, like, all these things are coming back to my mind. Like, like, you know, when you went up against Jeremy and, you know, and that first year going up to the 250 class, you know, and you slammed yourself quite a lot. And then the second year you learned to sort of like, I can't, I can't keep doing that, man. Totally. Well, you were fast, but you were just like, man, you, you had some wrecks that year. Oh, dude. Yeah. But I look back and I learned so much that year. I learned what yeah. not to do and it helped me be the guy that I was later on. Yeah, absolutely. So what about the motocross of nations? You touched on it. How it was such a big thing for you, you know, um, what was that like then coming over and racing the Euro guys? You, obviously you had so, so many good ones. Fox Hill, what an experience that must've been for you. Cause that's a typically European track, believe it or not in England, yeah. it was more fre- more like a French track than anything else. And of course it just hammered with rain. That was your yeah, first was, one, right? I was really, I was really bummed about uh, the the conditions at Fox Hills because uh, of the rain. But dude, that track, I loved it. It was a very similar to Gatorback. So when I got there, it was like flashbacks for me. Right. And I was right at home, honestly. I mean, I was ready to kick some ass. I'm like, oh, dude, this track is right up my alley. This is going to be fantastic. So I was really bummed when the weather kind of turned for the worst. But yeah, I mean, we talked about it a little bit. It was always an honor to uh, yeah. to race the motocross of nations. I uh, love everything about that event. Um, it is the single best event of the year. The vibe there is like no other. And anyone that has an opportunity um, to race that race, they need to, they need to take on it. Represent your company or your country, and and experience what that's like to race for your nation and country. It's, it's, it's an honor to do so. 
And I love that event. No doubt yeah. about it. I have great, I've had great experiences, some not, some not so great just because of track conditions and bad luck or, or what have you. But uh, yeah, each, each one of those events were extra special and uh, they're, they're moments that I'll cherish forever. 05 was obviously a good one. Erne, you went, that was, I think you went unbeaten again that year in the AMA, if I'm right. Yeah, I think that's it right. And then obviously that was a huge one. And then you had Townley chasing you in one race. But one that sticks with me was uh, obviously the 2007 at Bud's Creek. That, that, cause that was your farewell, wasn't it? If I, did you, did, that was, that was your last. That was it. Yeah. Was my last, so what, last what a way. What a way to go out. What a way to go out. Winning the yeah. Motocross Nations in your home country. I mean, that weekend was bonkers from the start. Yeah. There was punch-ups. <laughs> there was police called out. Then the after party was insane. I keep going on about that, Matt. Sorry, you, you do. There. It's the same, that's like the third interview he's talked well, about. Well, it's just, it's just one of the, it was just one of the great moments of my life. It was, it was one, one for the ages. And yeah, the, yeah, I mean, obviously for me, it was special for multiple reasons. My last my last professional race ever of my, uh, of my motorcycle racing career. Uh, it was the motocross of nations, motocross of nations in our home, in our home country. Um, yeah. So just, uh, we were able to win. I mean, just, uh, you know, a, a handful of emotions for all great reasons. So, uh, Rick, Ricky, what were the, um, what were the steps leading up to that decision that year of, um, of retiring in 07 and then, what were the emotions like on the uh, on the final race of that that weekend? What led you to that point? Follow the that year as far as my racing, my professional racing career. Yeah. I knew that I knew what that was going to look like uh, when I signed my Suzuki car. Why? I had specifically lined it up, uh, you know, to race two thousand five, two thousand six, and then. Um, part-time or full-time, depending on how I feel and where I was at mentally, physically. Um, but I knew, I knew that it was only going to be part-time for the most part. Was so you knew not just that year, you knew well in advance that you were thinking 2007 would be the final year. Yeah. Three years, three years prior. And uh, yeah, so that's, that was, that was basically it. I had accomplished everything that uh, I had ever wanted and I knew where I was mentally and physically and, I'm like, this is probably going to be it. So, and then leading up to the motocross of nations, it was just, it was a, it was a great, it was a great way to kind of say goodbye. You know, it was really a, um, a fantastic, a fantastic year. I got to race all my favorite tracks, all the venues that I wanted to, I won, you know, uh, all the outdoors that I race, I won three out of the seven supercrosses and I won the motocross of nations. I ended at motocross of nations against the best guys in the world at the time. So, I mean, on such, on such a high, there must've been doubts in that call to finish up then. Right. Or leave oh, up to no, 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 never, never once a doubt, never once a doubt. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Never once a doubt. Never. There's never once that I thought, man, maybe I should keep going ever, ever, ever. Did you just very quickly on that? Did you when did you find out that the motocross the nations was going to be? You know, that must have been a buzz because you're like, ah, oh, well, that's worked out as a perfect storm. It's come into America, yeah. and you know, so honestly, I didn't, I, Jeff, I can't remember. I no. can't remember when I got wind that it was going to be at Bud's Creek, but it worked out good for me. Yeah. It didn't ever. <laughs> Yeah, it definitely did. And then, and then you, you know, again, you know, we, we don't want to keep you too long, but you then. The end went into car racing, NASCAR. And uh, to be honest, that was, I wasn't expecting that one bit. I know yeah, a few of us have done it before you, like Wardy and, and Johnson and whatever, but I just didn't have you down as going, right, I'm, I'm off going four wheels. I just don't know why. Yeah, yeah. It was, uh, it was a great opportunity for me. I'd always kind of wanted to try something other than dirt bike racing. And uh, the opportunity came along and I had to jump on it. It was, a, it was good fun. It was good yeah. fun. You know, I came in with, no no experience whatsoever so and i was racing against guys that had been doing it for 30 years so uh it was tough but uh it was a fantastic experience i'm thankful for that experience as well and uh, i got to do a lot of cool things i met some great people great fans and that's uh, something that i'll remember and cherish forever yeah it was cool it was certainly I, think, I think that kind of rounds things off nicely in terms Absolutely. of, I mean, no, it yeah. doesn't. We want to keep talking to you forever, but 
We've got. But we know we in. can't. Yeah, I got a. He's got, I got a bike. I got a. I got a bike ride to go on too to keep this physique I got going on. Well, that's yeah. That's that. I mean, yeah, man. You've, you've yeah, got Jeff's yourself. Jeff's got to go and shape. work on something for his physique as well. I, I, well, it's I mean, actually coffee and cake. Is my next. <laughs> coffee and cake. It's, no, that's it's bang, bangers and mash, right? Bangers, bangers and, and mash, mash non-stop fish, every other meal chips. exactly. Or, to, or toad in the hole. Yeah, we get all toad. Yeah. Don't talk about uh, cuisine over there because you know you guys when you come over, you think our food's crap, and more often than not. Oh no, we've lost him. No, no, no I'm, back. Oh, I'm, I'm back. I'm back. Okay, bangers and mash. Yeah, bangers and mash. Fish and chips. Fish and chips. Yeah. Exactly. Well, that's right. We are going to wrap up the bulk, the main part, the portion of the interview, the main meal, the uh, the, uh, the the bangers and the mash, if you like. Thanks, fellas. Thanks Thank for you. having me on. It was truly a pleasure. Uh, I hate to get all sappy and stuff, but amidst the pandemic, COVID-19, I hope everybody that is listening to this show, you guys uh, included, are, are, are healthy, hanging in there, doing your part. Keep your head up, man, where everybody's going to get through this. It's definitely, uh, definitely sucks. There's no two ways about it, but uh, we'll get through this. The whole world will, and we'll be on the other side of it, and uh, everyone will be well. So we're thinking about you, and keep Keep fighting the good fight. And we'll see you at the, uh, an RCU teaching that Muppet there how to ride a bike. <laughs> Can't wait, guys. Thank you for having me on. I really, you might take that really, back. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Enjoy hey, your good bike. luck with the, um, your, your incredible show that's all going Real Talk 447. Yeah, uh, Real Talk thank 447. You for that. Check it out. All, all the sites. It's good stuff. It we'll is good stuff. Up. Thank you, Ricky. Stay safe. You and your family. A, bye now. And there you go. Hey. Yeah. Well, that's why I was wiggling around a little bit. In the end, <laughs> in the end I, had to pull this, I had to pull the desk towards me more. Is... My cheap wife front was starting to cut in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was wow. so good. Uh, you know, obviously, just purely because of what he's achieved. That's another reason I wanted to try and get Ricky on the show, was not just because, obviously, you talk about his amazing career, but also... It's a benefit from his massive show. following. Yeah, oh, right, sorry. Sorry. Okay, partly that too. <laughs> also, to just sort of show what... I don't know Ricky that well, but when I've always spoken to him, whatever, that's what he's like all the time. And yeah. I, know, I know he's like that when you see him on like his show with Jeff and you know, Real Talk 447, but that's, that's what you get. And I, I actually just admire always his honesty and he'll talk to anybody, and which in the position that he's in, you know, it can't be easy. Everybody wants a piece of him. So fair play to him for coming on the show. To be that grounded, that cool, and still chat as candidly yeah. over that Linda career, having that many people wanting a piece of you, like us two Muppets as well. Yeah, yeah. And there's us around yeah. and asking all different questions. You, you yeah. frothing and salivating all, all over him, honestly. Well, awesome. like I said, you know, the comparisons in our career are just, you know, it's not weird. too dissimilar. It's uncanny, honestly. It was like, I mean, as I said, you know, he's won what 16 AMA titles. I'd won probably, you know, a nine, 10, you know, club championships in my region. I mean, it's not to be sniffed at. The Christchurch Classic or whatever yeah, it was. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> hey, mate, that was that amazing. Was Thank you. Thank you, Jeff, for sorting You're that welcome. out. Thank you, JH, as well. Yes. Um, wherever you are for, uh, for helping hook that up and Ricky's rather valuable time. Hey, and while you're here, please hit subscribe and the like button. Do it right now. Why wouldn't you? That was awesome. That was the goat, no less, on our show. And, of course, there's Crow and Fro on our show, too, which is all the reason you need. Jeff, nice work, yes. sir. Oh, we've got something new tomorrow as well. We're going to record a thing with Dan Williams, which is going to be us kicking it with the kids. And this thing called, called TickBook and and and, <laughs> uh, and Facegram or whatever the kids do these days. I don't know. I don't know what I've it is. Heard, or, yeah, I've heard of that. Or, or, or Snap Twitter. I, I, I don't know. He's going to be he's going to be introducing us to all these things. And I think you won't like this, giving us a challenge to partake in. Uh, hmm. No, I'll do it. I'll do it. All right. It won't be very good, but I'll do it. Jeff, it's been a pleasure as always. Nice work, right. sir. I'm hooking that up. Uh, that, absolutely, no worries. I'm uh, as I mentioned, coffee you and cake. <laughs> I'm not that. I'm not that tragic. Oh, I've got, wow. you know, obviously motocross is my uh, is my my game, my life. So it's always good to talk to. Uh, I mean, it's mine uh, as well, Jeff. Come on, that's not. Well, fair. obviously, well, you're just starting out. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Jeffrey, right, go on then. I'm out of Vegas. here. Tally ho. Yeah. Let me do my two-step.